when it comes to assets and real estate ownership, most people have direct ownerships, meaning that they put these assets directly under their name. But did you know that there are other ways you can own assets too, such as putting it under a trust or LLC? Yes, you absolutely can do that. And in fact, it's been a pretty popular ways for people to own assets and real estate. And in today's video, we're gonna talk about trust. What is a trust? Why do people use trust to own assets? What are different types of trust? And what are the characteristics of these trusts, such as land trust and living trusts, and much more? So stay with me. So before we get started, my name is Bo Ji He, your local Bay Area real estate agent and expert. If this is your first time seeing my channel and you're eager to learn about real estate in general and just, you know, everything Bay Area, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button so you won't miss any of my future videos. Now, today, the topic is about trust. And uh, just a little disclaimer before we get into it. You know, I've been a real estate agent for the last 12 years, and my understanding of trust comes from all the deals that I represent where the property was under a trust, and also through my conversation and research, such a topic with the help of attorneys. And uh, so everything I'm going to say today are more of a generic uh, introductory uh, content about trust. Nothing too specific. If you have a complex problem and more specific problem and you're looking for an exact solution, my advice is to consult with a legal expert. All right, got that out of the way. So let's get started with uh, what's a trust. And I want you to think like this when it comes to a trust. It's basically a set of legal documents and agreements. Um, so, but think of it like this. You are the owner of a bunch of assets, you know, jewelries, money, or whatever. Now, you want to put these things in a chest, okay? A treasure chest. And now you're giving that key to uh, someone that you love and trust the most. Let's say your, your, uh, your son, okay? And uh, so in this relationship, you are the real owner of these assets. You are the grantor you basically create everything. And then this treasure chest that holds these assets are a trust. And then the person that basically, you know, holds the key that manage, the, you know, these assets are the trustee. A trustee basically does everything you say. You know, I want to invest these money here, there. I want to give this guy a little bit of money here and there. Trustee basically does the actual, carries out the actual task, but the decision comes from you. And in the event of passing away, these treasures belongs to, it goes to someone that you would call a beneficiary. So in other words, there's going to be a chest, which is the actual trust. And then there's the grantor, which is you who owns the assets. And then there's a trustee who actually does all these tasks of management and whatever decision that you make about the money in the trust. And then there's a beneficiary. That person basically gets these um, you know, money and assets after your uh, passing. The actual relationship between these parties could vary depending on the type of trust that you have. Now, I'm sure like up to this point, you're going to have questions like, wait a minute, why do I have to go through all this? You know, if I, if these are my money, why do I have to put them in a chest and give the key to someone else? Can I just, you know, keep these money and manage it myself? And if I want, you know, my daughter to have my money after I die, I'll just put them in a will. Sure, that's in fact what a lot of people do. But take a look at these three things that's most likely going to happen to everybody in, in America. And then you can decide, you know, if that's a problem or not. Okay. The first thing is, you know, everybody dies. And in America, if, if, if a person dies and this person only has a will, 
then this person is going to have to go through what we call a probate. A probate is basically a process where uh, all this person's belongings will have to be sold and become cash. And then through probate court, you know, they're going to go through a list of things to uh, figure out, you know, based on the will, who gets how much money, you know, and how much money is left after the sale. So, you know, the selling of this person's furniture, cars, whatever, it's called estate sales. And then selling this person's house is called a probate sales. And then after all that, you know, the attorney gets involved, the court comes in, and then they'll look at the, the will, and then they determine, you know, how much this person get and what. It's a lengthy and costly process. And a lot of your money will be gone, will be paid, you know, to the attorneys, the court, the, the commission of the sale of the house and all that. So in other words, you know, probate is an expensive, it's an expensive activity. And, um, I'm not sure about you, but I certainly wouldn't want a, a big portion of my assets gone, you know, lost during the probate process. So having a trust will take care of this problem. You don't have to go through probate, basically bypass that process and pretty much, you know, um, you know, like everything, uh, the, the asset gets distributed to uh, to your heirs accordingly. And not only it saves a lot of money, but also the distribution of assets become confidential. That's another huge thing. You know, I'm not sure about you, but, you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of people would not appreciate if they know who gets how much, you know, <laughs> like this heir gets this much and that heir get that much. They're going to have problems with each other, could be. So that's two benefits. And thirdly is... In, in the event of the grantor's incapacitation, so if you're getting old and you are, you know, you're not dead, but you're you're incapacitated, you can't think logically anymore. Certainly, you wouldn't be in position to manage all these money anymore. And having a trust, the successor trustee will step in and start making the decisions for you. They are your power of attorney to ensure that these money are properly managed. So with these three things, you know, that's why, you know, that's why trust is a popular choice among a lot of people. So there are two types of trust that we're going to talk about today in this video. One is the living trust. One is a land trust. And both trusts have the benefit of bypassing probate process saving you a lot of money. Both trusts have the feature of confidentiality when it comes to uh, uh, asset distributions. And uh, so, th so these are the similarities. So let's talk about living trusts. And living trusts, there are two kinds underneath. There's the revocable living trust, and then there's the irrevocable living trust. And for revocable living trust, the, the characteristic is that it's flexible, and you can go ahead and make changes whenever you want to. And that's something you might want to do. You know, as you get older, the situation changes and, you know, your thoughts become a little different. And also you may want to sell this house. Maybe it makes more sense to sell this house. In the event of all these changes, you as a grantor can just go ahead and make these changes without having to deal with anybody else's approval, right? And this is why the um, revocable living trust is a very popular choice among people that want to use living trust to uh, hold their assets. However, revocable living trust doesn't solve one problem. And that problem is if you have a lot of assets and uh, you're going to have to deal with uh, estate tax. So currently, the uh, exemption is about $12.9 million, which means if you own assets that are more than $12.9 million, whatever that's above are subject to estate tax. The estate tax could be 18% to 40% federal, and every state's got their own, uh, you know, 
percentage on top of that. So that could be a lot of money. And uh, for the majority of people in America, I mean, they may not have that kind of assets upon death. However, if you're in the Bay Area and if you own a couple of houses in uh, Palo Alto, Cupertino, uh, San Francisco, chances are these couple of houses put together, you know, will get you over that number. So this becomes a problem upon one's death when you want to pass your assets onto your onto your heir. You are definitely subject to to a lot of estate tax. And one way to solve this problem is by separating your personal assets from, you know, by using the irrevocable living trust. So what you do is, let's say you have totally. $20 million in assets, and a lot of it is real estate in the Bay Area. And uh, yep, you could put, let's say, $10 million worth of real estate into irrevocable uh, trust. That brings down your personal assets to another $10 million, and then you're good. And then upon death, the assets that's in irrevocable trust will be passed on to your heir without having to deal with uh, estate tax. And then your personal assets will be passed on to your heir without having to deal with um, you know, estate tax. So that's, that's why irrevocable trust provides benefit when it comes to estate tax. And the second benefit is it's asset protection, which means if you have creditors, you may not know that you are going to have creditors. Sometimes it just happens. Then having your assets in an irrevocable trust, it protects you against creditors. Now, you may think that you'll never run into those situations of having creditors, but sometimes it happens. You know, like I have a friend, he was he was doing uh, he was replacing his roof. So he hired a roofer, uh, the cheapest that he could find. And it was like fifteen thousand uh, dollars worth of service. So he went ahead and did it, and uh, he was happy with the result. And uh, two months later, he was hit with a surprise. Somebody put a lien on his house, and he was shocked. He was like, oh, what's going on? Well, it turns out that the roofer that he hired took the money, but did not pay the, the roofing supplier um, you know, for the material of the roof. So the supplier company went ahead and put a mechanic lien on his house saying that we did not get our money, but our product are on top of your roof. So you either take them off and give it back to me, or you pay me, or you find that you find that guy and have him pay me. Either way, I'm going to put a lien on your house. And that's exactly what happened. So yeah, it was a bummer for him. And uh, for those of you that don't know how liens work, basically, if you have a lien on your property, you cannot refinance. And if you if you you cannot transfer the property to someone else without clearing the lien, and if you sell it, part of your sales proceed will be used to pay off that lien. So either way, as long as there's a lien on your property, they're getting their money. <laughs> and uh, so eventually, I'm sure my friend he you know he paid the supplier uh, from his pocket because that roofer was nowhere to be found. It turns out that his license was not even his license. He borrowed someone else's license. So that's just a lesson learned. You know, don't always go for the cheapest solution. But it comes back to this topic. And if you put your property under a irrevocable trust, then nobody can touch it. Nobody can put a lien on that on that property. So that's another benefit when it comes to an irrevocable trust. So a quick summary before we get into a land trust is that when it comes to avoiding probate and the confidentiality of asset, uh, asset distribution, revocable, irrevocable are both are both going to ser uh, serve that uh, are both going to serve that purpose. However, revocable focuses on flexibility uh, of management. So if you are a control freak, then obviously you know. Don't go with irrevocable. You you got to do revocable all day long. And, you know, if you want to sell your house, you can just go ahead and make that decision yourself. For irrevocable, it's about estate tax and it's about protection against, you know, creditors. So these are completely different uh, purposes. 
And if you are a control freak, you're probably not going to like the idea of relinquishing your control by putting your assets into a irrevocable trust. So that's that's a psychological factor. But anyways, these are the two differences in a nutshell. And let's talk about land trust um, briefly. Now, land trust has similar functionalities and features like the living trust. It also bypasses the probate process. It keeps the confidentiality of asset distribution. However, land trusts differ from living trusts in the following way. Number one, land trust is specific to real estate. You cannot put any other assets in land trust, but living trust is for all assets. So for estate tax purposes, if, if real estate is only a small portion of your total asset, by putting that into a land trust may not help you. You may still exceed the $12.9 million uh, you know, exemption amount. So that's one thing. So land trust is specific to real estate. The second characteristic of land trust is its ownership is completely anonymous. In other words, there's no way you know who the real owner is under a land trust. So in land trust, the person that holds the title is the trustee. It's not the grantor. It's not the nobody else. It's not the trust even. Like if you have a living trust, then the living trust holds the title and then you can search who owns that living trust. So through that, you can figure out who the grantor is. But in a land trust, when you check the public record, the, the, the owner on the title is a trustee and it will always be a trustee. A grantor sits back and if the grantor wants to transfer assets to someone else, all he has to do is fill out a couple of paperwork, basically assignment of interest to someone. It's a very simple, easy process. And the interest, the property interest will be transferred to someone else. And even by doing that, there is no public record of that transfer. So in the public eyes, it's always going to be the name of the trustee that's on title. So you really don't know who right now is the actual owner. So that's the beauty of land trust. So now you may ask, why would someone want to keep that level of conf confidentiality? Well, the first group of people obviously will be uh, the celebrities, you know, like say Donald Trump. You know, he, there's no way you can prove that he owns any real estate assets, even though he lives in that big house, because I guarantee you he is, uh, unless I'm wrong, I could be wrong, but you know, most celebrities, it's a common sense that they don't put their property under their own name. You know, they'll probably put it on, they put it under a land trust so, so that nobody knows that they actually own all these homes. So that's number one. The second reason is, let's say you are a landlord, you are a uh, big time real estate developer, you own a lot of rental property, in Cal especially in California, Washington, a, a lot of these states are uh, uh, tenant friendly state. That means it's kind of difficult to deal with tenants sometimes, especially if you are a career landlord, You chances are you're dealing with many, many different tenants for many, many years. And, you know, issues could arise. You could run into someone that want to just trouble you. They just want to blackmail you. That happens all the time. And unfortunately, you know, in, in the state of California, um, if the tenant can find an attorney that, that will work with them, they literally have no cost when it comes to, you know, making a demand, a lawsuit and all that. But, for for the landlord, it's going to cost them a lot of money just to defend themselves. So on one hand, you know, the plaintiff has no cost. And on the other hand, the defendant has a lot of costs. So a lot of these cases ended up settling outside the court. And that's exactly what these type of tenant and attorney wants. And why would they do that? Well, the biggest reason is when they look you up, they can see that you own all these real estate uh, assets under your name. And that's a problem. It, that goes to show that you have a lot of money. So guess what? Let's go make a lot of money. And 
a lot of these attorneys will basically work the contingency plan with these tenants. Just come up with, 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 a, with a reason, with an excuse, something that seems reasonable. You know, I live in this property for many years and I have a health problem because landlord failed to do this and failed to do that. I mean, whatever the case might be. I mean, if there is a case, the tenant doesn't have to spend a dime to build this case, but the landlord will have to spend money to defend himself. So that's a problem. So, however, if you put your home under a land trust where they cannot even search you, they don't even know who owns this property, things become very different. Imagine the tenant went to the attorney and sits there and says, you know, I want to sue this landlord. And the attorney goes, okay, so who who's who's your landlord? What's the name? My landlord's name is Bob the Filthy Rich. Okay, Bob the Filthy Rich, and this is the property, but wait a minute. This property belongs to uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Do you know Arnold Schwarzenegger? I don't. I don't know him. I only know Bob the Filthy Rich. Well, you see... Okay, well, if that's the case, I will still work with you, but uh, we can't do contingency plan, unfortunately. Uh, you will have to pay me $400 per hour, and we'll work a 20-hour retainer. And if you still want to sue uh, this property owner, I'll have to do a lot of research. And, you know, so now when this happens, the cost of lawsuit goes up for the tenant. And most likely, they're not going to do that. If their mind is about, you know, making a quick cash, they're not going to do that. So in other words, it's a protection of liability if you have this level of uh, confidentiality of the owner name. And the third reason that I can think of is if a family has multiple heirs and, and it becomes a difficult decision to make when it comes to who gets this property. And there could be a lot of dramas um, take place if they all know who gets the property. So one way to do it is by doing it anonymously through land trust. Like I said, nobody ever knows the transfer of the property by searching public record. It won't show. So in the back end, you can always decide who gets the property without causing a you know, commotions among the heirs. So that becomes another popular tool uh, in dealing with this situation. So that's for the land trust. And a little recap again, you know, when it comes to uh, estate planning, bypassing probates and confidentiality of distribution of assets, living trust and land trust both gets the job done. And for living trust, the revocable living trust emphasizes on hands-on management of assets for control freaks because it's flexible. The irrevocable focuses on avoiding estate tax and protection of assets. And land trust focuses on ownership confidentiality. So which one is, and land trust also specifically pertains to real estate assets. Forgot to mention that. So which one is the right one for you? It's hard to say. It all depends on your situation and, and what your goals are. But uh, now that you understand what each trust, you know, the characteristics of each trust, and uh, hopefully it can help you make that decision a lot easier. There are other trusts too that I didn't mention, uh, such as charitable trust, uh, spendthrift trust, uh, blind trust, but, you know, Due to the lens of this video, we're not going to go into those trusts. You know, there are more specifics and that might be for, uh, for a different video. So anyways, still make sure you consult with a legal professional if you have a specific problem uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, setting up a trust or answering specific questions. This video is for information purposes only, and I'm a real estate agent and my understanding of a trust is definitely not going to be as detailed as a professional attorney, but I do my best to explain what is a trust and how it works in the language that everybody understands. That's the purpose of my job. So anyways, I hope you guys like this video. 
And um, for more contents that you would like uh, me to make, comment down below and let me know what other contents uh, that you would like me to do. I'd be happy to do one. And uh, remember, like and subscribe to my channel. And uh, thank you for your support. With that, uh, thank you for your time. And I will see you on the next video.